Okay, I think I will go ahead and start. So basically today uh, we're going to talk about uh, finding the middle ground between uh, monolithic and microservice architectures. And uh, we're going to take a look at the use case where we are trying to get like best of the both worlds and uh, journey together and see like what are the trade-offs uh, that we have to take for this. Uh, so, sorry, Dimitri. Seems that we losing your sound. So maybe you are muted or How about yeah. Now? yeah, that's better. Okay. Uh, I, 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 I'll pass the ball. Okay. Sorry for that. So uh, my name is Dimitri. I'm with Media Cloud uh, Engineering Team at Netflix. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of background. Uh, on what our team is doing because it gives like better understanding of the use case uh, uh, for basically Caraf. Uh, so as the uh, name of the team states, we're basically uh, processing media in the cloud uh, and we're doing it at scale. Uh, sorry, we st <laughs> the sun is still off, uh, Dimitri, again. I don't know what's going on. Can you try? Okay, how about now? Yeah, yeah now it's good, it's good. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Some of the functions of uh, our team uh, is we're building a platform to support uh, uh, a variety of media transformations and uh, innovations at scale for uh, Netflix. Uh, we're focusing on scalability, reliability, uh, developer productivity, uh, and compute efficiency. Uh, basically, one of the uh, key things that we are doing is we're abstracting uh, uh, out uh, all sorts of common uh, functionality uh, across uh, multiple applications and we let uh, engineers who are focusing on uh, uh, media processing like encoding like video encoding audio encoding or processing images uh, uh, we let them basically focus 100 percent on uh, uh, their job while we're taking care uh, of uh, scalability uh, and uh, uh, basically computer efficiency, uh, distributing the system and uh, hiding all this complexity for them. Uh, we're building reusable frameworks and application and services to uh, drive agility in content engineering. So what are we going to talk about uh, today? Uh, and like taking a little step a little bit uh, back since we're involved uh, a lot with media processing and media processing is uh, uh, very uh, computationally intensive uh, process in most cases. Uh, we will be talking about systems that uh, are mostly asynchronous uh, in nature. Uh, so what are we gonna talk about? So we will discuss uh, a limitation and advantages of both uh, microservice and uh, monolithic uh, architectures uh, and uh, identify what are the properties 
that we're interested in from uh, getting from both of them in uh, our design. Uh, we will go through uh, development and uh, release cycles of uh, uh, our systems uh, to basically show how uh, our design uh, based on graph fits uh, those. Uh, we will analyze uh, trade-offs of taking the hybrid approach uh, and we will discuss how specifically Caraf helps us to facilitate this hybrid approach and what are some uh, uh, perks that we are getting out of it. So we will start with Monolith uh, because this is basically how we started uh, back when Netflix started uh, streaming. So uh, there are like, um, there is a multitude of different definitions uh, that you can find online of what a monolithic application is. We will just uh, try to define uh, how we see it like within our organization uh, and what makes sense to our uh, use case. So basically monolithic architecture uh, assumes that the system that is built is like independent and is self-contained. Uh, that means it's not going to, it might use some uh, database or search engine or messaging queue, uh, but uh, it doesn't uh, talk to uh, other systems. So it performs its functions like end to end. Uh, that means like this whole uh, application, which is monolithic is going to perform like each and every single tasks that uh, the system is supposed to uh, perform. Uh, it is stateless and uh, this is like uh, an interesting part and, and later we will see why why uh, I include this into uh, uh, definitions but again this is kind of some of the uh, principles that we we uh, see important for even monolithic architectures in uh, our team uh, so it is tightly coupled with technology stack uh, basically for analytic applications, it's really hard to migrate from one database to another database or to a different messages system or uh, to any other technology, like uh, even, even uh, I don't know, from uh, Spring Boot to Craft, just because there's, uh, it's always a big, big bang and you have to like change uh, everything. And in many cases, it's just easier to just uh, throw the old system away and just write a new one uh, with the technology stack uh, that you want, which is actually what we did. Um, so a monolithic uh, application resides in a single source code repository, and uh, it's okay when it's small and the application is young, but when it starts growing, it becomes uh, a problem. And we will see what, what kind of problems are uh, there associated with this uh, property of a monolithic uh, application. Oh, an example of uh, a monolith, and I'll just come. Uh, I'll just mention like a, a very classic one, which is a web store, which prefer, performs like uh, a set of functions, like search of products, product view, and then you uh, add your products to shopping cart and you order them, and then you may leave some reviews and some other one. And this is just one application. So all of the things are reside in one repository. They deployed uh, as a single uh, uh, unit. They don't talk to any other applications. Uh, they are like independent and self uh, contained. Uh, and basically uh, they work to some extent, but to the point where they stop like working in some ways. So what are some pros of of monolithic applications. They're really simple to develop. Uh, there are no like complex dependencies. You don't have to uh, uh, basically have five different uh, IDs open with your source code uh, going through different changes and different uh, 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 layers. And uh, uh, again, it just works when, when it's small. Uh, it is simple to test. Uh, that's a good part about monolith, whether it's small or big, uh, 
because it's self-contained, uh, it's it's uh, easier to cover it with uh, unit tests, uh, and as well as end-to-end -end tests like smog tests, regression tests, or whatever tests you can come up with. It's easy with monolithic application. Uh, deployment is easy, uh, so it's packaged to the single uh, deliverable, and then this deliverable just gets deployed. And if you uh, don't have any automation, you can just copy your, uh, you know, binary to uh, uh, your target uh, machine or instance, and it's going to work. Uh, and simple horizontal scaling. And this is uh, where the server serverless comes in play. Uh, why is it simple? It's just because you can just run multiple instances of uh, the same code base, uh, and they will be handling behind some load balance when they will be handling requests uh, and uh, working just fine. Uh, operations are easy because uh, everything is one place. Uh, you don't have to dig through uh, various layers of uh, networking to figure out what's going on with your system if something goes wrong. Uh, okay. What are some of the cons of this uh, architecture? Basically, it has various practical limitations in size and uh, complexity. And what that means is uh, once your code base gets bigger, it's really hard to uh, understand what's going on uh, in the system, especially for people who are joining the team or uh, uh, even people like who never worked with this application and they just start working with it, it's hard uh, and complex. And also, also it's uh, hard to understand what are the what is the impact of the changes that I'm uh, making to uh, the system and which parts I can affect because everything is uh, in the same uh, code base. Uh, all those classes could be shared, uh, and behavior that I'm changing could not be expect, expected by some other uh, parts of the system. Um, lower development productivity with large, uh, larger code bases, uh, not just because it's complex and you have to be really careful about the changes that you're making, but just because like with a huge code base, your uh, ID starts working uh, like pretty slowly and and uh, it's getting bogged and uh, it all takes time uh, builds take uh, time because all of this needs to uh, get compiled and uh, basically uh, tests are uh, running longer because the remote tests to cover a bigger code base um, continuous deployment is hard or impossible well for the same reasons uh, because uh, you cannot be really confident uh, uh, about the changes that you're making. There is like a big set of uh, tests that, that are developed to uh, make sure that there is no regression uh, in any part of the system. And uh, those tests, um, basically those tests uh, take longer. And also because it's like a uh, single big, big code base, which is which the entire team is working on, uh, there are various commits coming from uh, different people uh, and, and like continuous deployment and continuous integration is either uh, really hard or even uh, impossible. Uh, so there are also concerns like about reliability uh, because there is no failure isolation. If there is one line of code uh, which goes into some infinite loop and allocates memory, this would just kill the entire application. Uh, and basically, uh, this is a part that uh, microservices are better at. And yeah, hard to adopt new technologies. Uh, because everything is like uh, very dependent inside the monolith. Uh, the only way to change to a new technology is to do like a big bank or like start developing some sort of abstractions in Java layer, but uh, one way or another, it is hard. And, and this is why many of uh, monolithic uh, applications 
uh, they're pretty much married to their technology stack and they uh, at best migrate into newer versions of uh, things that uh, they're using already. Okay, yeah, so this, this is, these are monolithic applications and we've been operating those for uh, quite some time. Uh, and uh, when, when the entire Netflix uh, started switching to microservices, we basically uh, did not rush. We, first thing we did is we uh, just extracted a few services out of uh, our monolith and we continued to uh, operate it uh, till the point where we decided, okay, now it's time to uh, uh, rewrite our platform uh, due to various limitations uh, and evolve. And then we started looking into microservices. And at this point at Netflix, there was already some paved path for microservices and there was like some experience accumulated. So microservices, uh, again, this is a definition which makes sense for ours and uh, us and basically uh, it doesn't like identify what a microservice is uh, from all possible aspects by any means, but uh, this is what we have and this is what, what makes sense to us. So uh, microservices are loosely coupled with other microservices. They always work uh, as a group. Uh, each microservice performs like a specific tasks, a task rather than uh, an end-to-end -end function. Uh, like a group of microservices would perform an end-to-end -end function. And then each microservice uh, out of uh, the group uh, would reside in its own source code repository. Uh, and it's a separate deployment as well. And it's also stateless. So an example would be basically the same web store where each of the uh, mentioned like uh, uh, groups of tasks is performed by microservice. So there's going to be a product search microservice, uh, product view microservice, or the place pre placement microservice, uh, product reviews microservice, and maybe some others. Uh, this is like the web store which got split into microservices. So some of the pros of microservices. Uh, independent development of each microservice and uh, low complexity uh, for uh, individual microservice. Uh, like the scope of the microservice is isolated to a single task and it's easier to understand that it. uh, uh, it's faster to learn a, a microservice code base and uh, does uh, development of a single microservice is faster, failure isolation. So yeah, if something fails uh, in a system which is built out of microservices, uh, uh, and if it's done like uh, in the correct way, then only like this specific microservice would fail uh, or potentially like some microservices that uh, depend on it as well. So uh, continuous integration, continuous uh, deployment now because there, the, the code base is not too big. There are not the amount of tests that need to run. Uh, if you change something is not too big, you can go with a continuous uh, deployment and continuous integration. Uh, independent horizontal scaling. Uh, that's like uh, one of the good parts is that you can scale uh, only, only parts that uh, care about scaling without uh, um, scaling uh, microservices that don't. Uh, lower barrier of adoption of new technologies. Uh, yeah, you can, you can in, in, in this architecture, you can go just microservice by microservice and the amount of changes that need to happen to a microservice is just isolated to uh, this microservice and uh, different microservices inside the system can run on different uh, technology stacks or use different databases or uh, different search engines, different queues, or anything uh, they want to, and it's uh, easier to switch back and forth if needed. Uh, some of the cons of microservices, so high complexity for uh, 
microservice group because now it's like a distributed system with all the complexity of so, uh, inheriting uh, complexity of the distributed uh, systems. So lower testability of the entire system because now in order to test something, you just need to have all of your microservices running. Uh, harder to implement and uh, roll out changes spanning multiple microservices. This usually like happens in steps. First, you like uh, do one microservice, then you release it, and it has to be in a backward compatible manner. Then uh, the next microservice picks this change up, and uh, there we go. In in monolithic application, you just change your code base and you deploy it. And this because like this deployment is like more or less atomic, it's it's gonna just fly. Uh, harder operations for. Uh, microservice group. Yeah, there's going to be a lot more Jenkins job pipelines, places to look for logs, uh, uh, monitoring dashboards and alerts coming from different ways and uh, whoever is on call uh, for a system like this. Uh, dreams every time to go back to monolithic application. Increased computational resource con consumption. Like uh, in order to work together, uh, there is a quite a bit of like uh, services that are uh, microservices would need uh, to be able to cooperate. And uh, there's definitely, uh, for example, in our case, each microservice is going to run a separate JVM, which is already in overhead and. There are many other aspects with which increase uh, computational resource consumption. So, uh, in general, uh, monolithic uh, applications, uh, and it's in, in its inside structure, are not very different from microservices. So, what is it? Is it a microservice or is it a monolith? Uh, it could be anything, right? Uh, what are some myths, right, about microservices? And they're not really myth, but uh, things that are more not practical, like polyglot. This, like, uh, the idea of polyglot. Uh, yeah, they can be polyglot. Each microservice could be built in its own language, but is it practical? Like, just imagine yourself being a hiring manager who uh, runs a team of five engineers, and uh, the team owns like ten microservices, different in five different languages hiring, uh, you know, uh, engineers with experiences and all those five languages is just going to be a nightmare. So uh, is it like really practical or does it really matter? Uh, at least not for us. Sure, nothing. Yeah, well, that's another uh, thing that uh, microservice community would brag about. But the reality is like uh, you could build microservices that share nothing, but this would be just, you know, each and every team for each and every microservice would be coming with a technology stack and then uh, building those auxiliary services that are needed to run all those uh, microservices. This would be like very, very uh, uh, impractical and, and too like uh, expensive. Yeah, so is it, it is possible, but not practical. Uh, so what do microservices share? So common libraries and frameworks, uh, common infrastructure level services, uh, such as discovery, configuration, metrics, login, each and every microservice basically needs to have those uh, in order to function uh, properly or like being uh, operational, operational and uh, in general, uh, there is quite a lot of automation that needs to happen uh, around microservices uh, to make them work. Uh, and who like ships all those uh, common things? Usually, like in, in companies, uh, this this is like the basically function of uh, runtime teams or platform teams. They uh, build this framework. They Evaluate, adopt. Uh, they they uh, provide all those services and basically uh, they focus on yeah infrastructure like for a specific programming language, which is uh, in our case Java. So 
uh, they build, maintain distribute common frameworks and libraries, and they build, maintain, and operate common services like uh, uh, discovery or configuration or uh, login or uh, anything else uh, you can think about that's needed for microservices. So, uh, and they that lets uh, microservice developers focus on business logic and also saves them from uh, like spending their human resources on developing uh, same things over and over. Uh, and they like pretty much provide you a paved path for developing uh, microservices as well as they shoot them uh, their commons uh, to on daily basis uh, with latest and paste fixes to uh, the owners of microservices. So this is what the function of this team is. And uh, uh, this is like, uh, was like a key to one of the keys to, to our uh, decision to use Caraf. Like since we have this, uh, all those common services and we have all this like big bundle of libraries uh, shipped to basically our platform, we should just leverage this. Uh, and later we'll see how. So. Uh, full cycle development. Uh, basically, this is how development of a microservice like what usually happen. And uh, uh, an important thing here is, is a responsibility of uh, like every engineer in the team. So you design, you develop, then you test, then you deploy, uh, then you operate it and you support it. Uh, and uh, uh, this just goes in circles uh, while you are only in this microservice. This is basically what a full cycle development means. So, uh, which is also another like uh, uh, aspect of, uh, uh, and actually what, one of the reasons why we chose the, the hybrid approach and uh, uh, basically used uh, Craft to implement it. Uh, so, a microservice, like a typical microservice development uh, life cycle CI, CD. So uh, there's a project structure which is getting usually generated by some Gradle plugin. Uh, and it's going to create a Git repository, Jenkins jobs, and Spinnaker pipelines for uh, deployment. Uh, and then an engineer would create a feature branch, develop a feature, cover it with tests, and then um, it, uh, the code is getting pushed into this feature branch uh, in Git and uh, is going to trigger Jenkins jobs execution and Spinnaker pipelines and it's going to get uh, deployed in, into cloud into a non-production environment. And then cloud instance uh, basically uh, gets created uh, and turn tests are run against it and if everything is uh, successful, uh, then an engineer will create a pull request to master uh, make, you know, some teammates, uh, look at it, approve it, and then it's going to get, uh, merged. And once, uh, this happened, there's again, there's, uh, another instance of, uh, microservice, which, uh, is getting created. And then again, end to end tests are run. And if, uh, they're successful, then the push is merged and it goes to production. And here is like uh, another important thing is, uh, those instances that are constantly getting created in the cloud uh, to just, you know, serve a few requests. Uh, and then usually what would happen is they would uh, just expire after certain uh, TTL and they will just uh, go away. But still most of the time of uh, their lifespan, they're just sitting there doing nothing. So what were our goals when we were looking uh, at Coraf? So we thought, okay, well, microservices are okay, but uh, we'd also like to have like some easier operations and less uh, cognitive overhead of all those microservices and uh, lots of Jenkins jobs and uh, Spinnaker pipelines uh, and like some better dependency management because uh, it's Spring Boot and typical like uh, microservice at Netflix, uh, many things, many, if there's a bug, for instance, in platform, uh, which leaked and uh, 
many microservices picked it up, they need to also pick up a fix. And uh, for this, you need to chase people uh, and ask them to update the, their their dependencies. Uh, sometimes like uh, this happens automatically, but if it uh, fails or um, the, the job, basically their, their dependency of the job uh, in Jenkins fails, uh, this would not happen. Or sometimes people not just paying attention. Oh, it's just a dependency job. It's not impacting anything. Uh, you basically need to let them know uh, that there is a problem and, and they need to address it. Uh, yeah, and the other thing is uh, spend less on cloud infrastructure um, and get a bit of better testability of uh, microservice uh, groups together because like deploying each and every service into its isolated environment is not really practical. So this is where Karaf comes in picture. We started looking at uh, what can we do. We found uh, uh, Karaf because we were looking at OSGI. And uh, so some of the key things that were again uh, influenced our decision. So we knew that we are uh, not going to build polyglot microservices because we are a Java shop and uh, this uh, runtime team provides support only for Java. So uh, that's like safe to assume that in the nearest future, we are not going away from Java. So, okay, this this is perfect. We can use Karaf. Uh, we also want it to be uh, multi tenant So we wanted to... Uh, leverage and reuse resources uh, on the host, especially in uh, uh, non-production environments where uh, all those uh, instances, they just serve a couple of requests and then they sit for a few days uh, uh, without doing anything. Uh, they're just being paid for. Um, yeah, and then we wanted to have an ability to deploy uh, in a reasonable manner uh, services into an isolated environment so that we could test them together or debug something when they're running together. And uh, the reason for like isolated environment is, again, uh, because uh, we are mostly asynchronous and we are communicating through messaging systems and there's a good chance that uh, some other microservice would just pick up your message or some other instance of microservice would just pick up your message and you won't see what happened. Um, yeah, and we also wanted to uh, share uh, all those common services uh, like login metrics, uh, configuration, and discovery uh, between various services because they present like a quite a big overhead uh, given, given like, for instance, discovery, uh, like all the, all the uh, map of uh, Netflix microservices is get, getting shipped to your instance so that you could call any of those services. And pretty much same, same, same comes to configuration. Um, so, we also wanted to have uh, an ability to quickly ship any fixes uh, or library updates uh, or features to all of the microservices that are built on top of our platform. Uh, and we'll see later how, how this was achieved. Uh, yeah, also reducing the number of Jenkins jobs and uh, deployment pipelines. Uh, to make like operations easier is a good thing. Um, and uh, of course, uh, a cut in computational resources that, uh, that would be needed to run uh, uh, if we just started using the standard microservice approach. So basically this is how uh, our, our platform uh, looks like in a nutshell. So there is this, whatever this platform team ships to us uh, is like a runtime bundle. Uh, and basically 
It's going to include configuration service, discovery service, magic service, login service, uh, and all the common dependencies uh, that the libraries and also some of our own code that uh, basically is needed to uh, make all of this happen. And then there are all of those microservices which are going to have only uh, their own code and uh, uh, only their own code uh, and maybe some of the dependencies uh, that they bring which are not part of the bundle. So this is how we structure it. So login configuration metrics, discovery, uh, and some other services, they're just exposed as uh, through OSGI registry and uh, uh, as services and uh, um, common dependencies uh, are shared through export package. And this is how uh, like microservice bundles can use it. Uh, so runtime is activated by Instantiate the GUI's container with all those services and some of the services that, that uh, we built to, to basically make this architecture work. And then uh, microservices activated by uh, pinning the common uh, uh, OSGI services from, from uh, registry. Uh, and again, instantiating a juice container. Uh, and after that, that's it, the microservices started. So some of the things that we had to build. So uh, because Caraf gives you like so much freedom, there are just so many ways that, that you can structure uh, similar like architectures. We, we just didn't find anything that, that which could work for us uh, to package neither runtime uh, uh, nor uh, like this microservices out of the box. So. Uh, we just had to build some of them. So for runtime, we used, uh, uh, it's like a huge OSGI bundle, which is uh, basically a number jar of all, all the dependencies. And uh, it just exports uh, common libraries that would be needed by microservices. Uh, it also gets packaged together with Caraf uh, in a Docker uh, image uh, with all the needed uh, dependencies. And this is going to be our like uh, base image, which uh, we're going to use later to deploy microservices to. So microservices packaging uh, will leverage BND tools, and we will only package dependencies that are not uh, supplied by runtime. The other ones will be skipped. Uh, and there is also a microservice lifecycle uh, management tool that we uh, have, and uh, basically, uh, is responsible for like starting, stopping microservices, deploying them, and uh, rolling the back if they malfunction. And uh, yeah, that pretty much the, these are its basic responsibilities. So uh, I think I'm gonna go like quickly through some achievements because we're running uh, out of time. Uh, so we reduced infrastructure costs compared to like previously system that we were running. Uh, as a monolith by approximately like 90 percent uh it's easier operations due to less Jenkins job and deployment pipelines better dependency management uh faster deployments uh improved testability of the system uh i think it's just been duplicated somehow so some problems like that we have to like uh still solve well one of them is like failure isolation because uh we're back to like being sort of kind of like a monolith where one microservice can just consume all, all of the uh, resources or consume of the memory and just uh, kill GVM or use all the CPU or just saturate network interface. Uh, and the other one is, uh, which is maybe less of a problem, but uh, immutable infrastructure is one of the like key paradigms of microservices. It's where like your once packaged or your your code cannot change anymore and you can just it's like a repeatable deployment for uh for a microservice or you can roll back to like a previous version easily uh but uh, again as, as long as we can figure out a similar alternative uh we could do this or um 
very very like uh, straightforward way to solve it is uh, you just deploy each microservice uh, into like a separate graph instance, uh, which also delivers you failure, your isolation uh, and immutable infrastructure. But uh, if you basically, it is going to be the same as Spring Boot. And if you do it uh, basically for only production environments, you will still benefit. Okay, we're a little bit over of time. Uh, this is the end for me. Uh, I'm going to take uh, questions that I see. How you test your microservices uh, in Graph system integration tests? Uh, so it's so it's testing is a bit complex because now there are two parts to it. You just deploy your microservice. And you also deploy this runtime, and those two deployments are uh, separate. So for runtime, uh, there is a step like before it goes to production, which uh, uh, which basically takes all the microservices that we have and uh, it tries to start them on a new uh, uh, version of uh, runtime, and then performs a health check. And after that, uh, uh, it can go to production uh, for microservices there is like uh, uh, regular CI CD uh, basically uh, there are unit tests there is like a testing parameter there are unit tests uh, which run every run and they run every time you build them and then uh, uh, there are basically integration tests uh, and end-to-end -end tests that are, uh, run in the cloud. Uh, and uh, what we do is like specifically for this component that we uh, use on Craft, we just we just create a separate stack and we just deploy all the services that are needed into this stack. Um, that's going to also to have like isolation in messaging layer and in uh, database. So. Uh, you can guarantee that this specific project is going to be completed by this specific stack. Okay, hope that answers the question. How you resolve the external dependencies are not available. As always, GI bundle. Uh, so there's a Gradle. There is a Gradle plugin which we developed for uh, packaging, and uh, uh, if those, if so, the, this plugin would look into runtime and see if those dependencies are present there and exported. And if not, then it's just going to package it uh, those dependencies into the microservice bundle. Yeah, exactly. What whatever uh, JB said. Uh, yeah, again, runtime team is, you can think about them as like uh, somebody provides you like, like Spring Boot, for instance, Not, nothing, uh, nothing different. They give you Spring Boot and they operate those uh, uh, and they operate those uh, global uh, services like to register your microservice uh, uh, and uh, we provide you with all this infrastructure and then uh, the rest is pretty much uh, the rest is pretty much uh, working the same way as uh, as uh, like you described so you design, you develop, you test, you deploy, you operate, and you support it, including answering all the questions to teams that are going to use your microservice. Yeah, well, 90% is like specific to our case. Uh, might, might not be the same for like everyone, but we figured out that we're using like a whole lot of uh, 
whole lot of computational resources for non-production environments. And uh, this is one thing. And then probably there's a good uh, chunk of savings that are coming from not running uh, all those uh, like common services for each and every microservice and not, not running GVM. Because every time you start GVM, you, you're just saying, uh, this is the minimum memory that I'm going to need or you're going to just, if you start like every Java application, you will basically right away start a bunch of threads that are going to, to be uh, trying to do like garbage collections and all the auxiliary stuff for and consuming CPU, especially if you're on uh, uh, G1 uh, garbage collector. Okay, hope that answers all the questions. If that's it, then thanks everyone. Thanks, Dimitri. Well, it was great. Very. Uh, I like the, the analysis at the beginning because it's a uh, clear state of the art. So yeah, that's a great session. Uh, very interesting. Um, I hope it opens some uh, some minds uh, to the different use cases and uh, and use of Caraf. And uh, now we have at the end of the Caraf track. So it was a uh, it was really great. Uh, I think a very well balanced talks, uh, different perspective, different standpoint. And uh, yeah, um, again, don't hesitate to jump on website mailing list. Um, I'm gonna share my slides, I guess, but Dimitri and other uh, speakers will will share as well. Uh, but yeah, uh, don't hesitate to ping us uh, if you have any question or if you want to uh, give a try to, to Caraf and the new uh, new features. Um, the next couple of months will be uh, very strategic, I think, for, for, for the project. And uh, we open to uh, new use cases again. So yeah, that's very exciting. Thanks a lot for all for your for attendee and uh, enjoy the rest of ApacheCon. See you guys. Cheers.